Well, good evening and uh, welcome to the Independence Business Debate uh, organised by the Cooper Business Network. My name's Peter Southcott. I'm a partner in Carter's accountants based in the Cooper office. And uh, for my sins, I'm also the chairman of the Cooper Business uh, Network. Just a little sales pitch for the uh, Business Network before we get on to the really important stuff for this evening. But the Cooper Business Network, we're a small group of business owners that come together on the first Tuesday of every month in the uh, coffee shop in the garden centre. We come to network, to learn from each other, and to try and find business by way of referrals. And hopefully some of you would have met uh, our fellow members or some of my fellow members uh, in the networking opportunity before we started uh, this evening's uh, session. If any of you would like to know more about the Cooper Business Network, please uh, call one of the members or uh, see me afterwards and let me have uh, your details. That's the end of the sales pitch, and, and uh, I do apologise, but I had to make a wee bit of a sales pitch for the, the Cooper Business Network. But it is for such a small group of business owners, I'm delighted that we've been able to organise and host this event. And importantly, I'm delighted that so many of you have turned out on a Friday evening to make this uh, a, a success. So thank you very much for doing that. I've got one or two special thank yous uh, I'd like to uh, make just before I introduce our uh, guest speakers for the evening. And a, a big thank you has to go to John from uh, Alliot IT for really being instrumental in organising the event, sending out the tickets and working hard this evening. Uh, also, he's uh, videoing it as our official record of this evening. I'd like to thank uh, Alan Morrison, who's just about to snap a photo here, but he is our official photograph. But Alan of ASM Media and PR was very instrumental in getting the PR out to the uh, media, and he's the official photographer for this evening, so thank you. I also need to uh, quickly thank uh, Sharon Hopkins of Fife Chamber for organising the venue, and finally to the partners of Carters for sponsoring the event this evening. But it does give me great pleasure to welcome uh, John Swinney, MSP, and Murdo Fraser, MSP, to Cooper this evening. And thank you for giving up your time uh, on a Friday evening. With less than a year to go to the referendum debate, I think it's important that as business owners, we are informed. We've got to be able to make informed decisions. And who better than our two guest speakers this evening? It's a business debate. Tonight is about business. And you know, with, with John uh, Swinney, who's the MSP for Perthshire North, but the Cabinet Secretary for Finance, Employment and Sustainable Growth in the Scottish Government. Murdo Fraser, the MSP for Mid-Scotland and Fife, the convener of the Economy, Energy and Tourism Committee in the Scottish Parliament. I'm hoping that we will hear the information that we need to make informed decisions in just under, was it 320 days, I believe, uh, until the referendum. But it would be interesting just to take a, a, a straw poll this evening. How many of you have already made up your, your minds which way you're going to vote? Wow, that's a huge number of people. So that, but there's still a, a, a lot of people that obviously are undecided. And that's why I hope by the end of this evening, you'll have more information to be able to make up your mind which way to vote. It's such an important event that I would, and I'm impartial on this as the chairman for this evening. I'm impartial, but I would encourage everybody that they, to, to take the vote next year one way or the other. Yes or no, I don't mind how you vote, but please, I'd encourage you all to take that vote. I'm just going to quickly run over the format this evening and remind everybody of the format. We're going to start in a few minutes with opening statements. Each side will uh, have the opportunity to make an opening statement, maybe five minutes each, after which they're going to have a few minutes to maybe probe, cross-examine, comment on anything that has been raised by uh, the other speaker in their opening statement. 
We then will throw it out because it's you, the audience. You're the people with the questions. So we're going to have an open uh, question and answer session. I have two uh, assistants this evening with roving mics. So please wait to, uh, until you get the microphone uh, to ask your question so that everybody can hear it clearly. But I would ask that why we're having the opening statements and uh, closing statements that you keep and save any applause to the end but during the question and answer session, do feel free to applaud any particular answer or uh, point that has been raised. And the aim is that at about 20 to 8, each uh, of our guest speakers will be able to do a closing statement, closing comments and remarks, and we wrap up and close at 8 o'clock. So at this point, I'd like to pass over to John Swinney, MSP. Thank you. Thank you, Peter, very much, and thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for uh, the invitation to come along tonight and for your attendance tonight to take part in what's the most important debate this country has had about its future uh, in the last 300 years. Um, I believe in Scottish independence for a very simple reason. I believe that the people that are best equipped to decide and to take all of the decisions that relate to the future of our country uh, to our interests, to our prospects, to our ambitions and our aspirations are the people who choose to live and to work within Scotland. And uh, I, I believe that before we had a Scottish Parliament, but I believe it ever more emphatically since we've had a Scottish Parliament, because what I've seen the Parliament do in the last, uh, in the years since 1999, is take a set of decisions which have been about the interests of the people of Scotland and decisions embedded in addressing the interests and the needs of the people of our country. Uh, let's, for example, look at the way in which the Scottish Parliament has taken forward the agenda for health in Scotland, where with the way in which we have uh, made our choices and our priorities, we have delivered improvements in the way in which our health care and our health care system is undertaken in Scotland. And we've also taken bold decisions, such as banning smoking in public places, to take decisive decisions that will support and advance the interests of our country. And if we look at other areas of policy, in education, for example, we've exercised our responsibilities to make a choice that we will enable people to access um, higher and further education in Scotland without the, uh, the thought and the fear of paying for tuition fees. People will be accessing higher and further education on the basis of the ability to learn, not the ability to pay. And these are some of the examples of how we've used the powers that we have had, essentially the independence that we have exercised over health or education in the years since 1999. And what I want to do and what the message about independence is all about is about ensuring that we complete the powers of the Scottish Parliament, that we, where we exercise independence over health or education or local government or transport or housing today, that we now exercise those responsibilities across a wider sphere of activity in the economy, in international relations, in the way in which we take forward our approach to welfare within Scottish society. And why do I think that's important? Well, I think it's important because we can increasingly see divergent interests between Scotland and the rest of the United Kingdom on the economy. Uh, I took a fundamentally different set of decisions to deliver economic recovery in Scotland compared to the UK government back in 2010. I believed that the way to get the Scottish economy moving was to invest in capital expenditure when the UK government decided to cut capital expenditure. I did all that I could within my powers to expand the, the size and the scope of the capital budget and the, uh, and the impact that would have in construction within the Scottish economy to create employment. But I had to do that with my hands tied behind my back because of the decisions taken by the UK government. And what we see out of all of that is an economic performance in Scotland that's better than the rest of the United Kingdom and a situation where we could have made it even more successful if we'd been able to exercise decisions over economic policy here for ourselves in Scotland. And for me, that's one of the great prizes of independence. It will give us the opportunity to take decisions about our economy, to the, about the very prospects of our citizens, about the hopes and the aspirations of people in terms of boosting their 
uh, th th their employment opportunities and their economic activities by having the ability to take those decisions here in Scotland. And one of the encouraging things about the debate that we have in Scotland on the economic question, and I see this enormous change over the 20 years or so that I've been involved in the economic debate about Scotland's future. 20 years ago, people would have doubted, and my opponents would have advanced an argument, which would have said that Scotland couldn't afford to be an independent country. And now it is universally accepted, right across the political spectrum, that Scotland can be uh, can afford to be an independent country. Why do we think that? Well, we think that because, why do we all believe that? Because uh, in each of the last 30 years, Scotland has paid uh, more, generated more in tax revenues per head than any other part of the United Kingdom. It's because on the last data, we contributed more to the UK than we got back in return. Um, on the basis that Scotland is a strong and effective economic unit able to pay its way in the world. So now that the debate has moved on from whether Scotland could be an independent country, whether we could afford to be an independent country, which is a point that's now very broadly accepted in the political debate in Scotland, I think we're now on to the more substantive debate about whether Scotland should be an independent country. And I think Scotland should be an independent country to enable us to take the decisions in Scotland on our economy, just as we've taken them on education or on health, or on transport, or on housing, or on local government, in the interests of the people of Scotland, and to shape a set of priorities and a set of approaches that meet the needs and the conditions of people that live here in Scotland. That, for me, is the argument why Scotland should be independent, and I look forward to discussing that with you tonight. Thank you very much. Thank you. Well, uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, thank you for giving up your Friday night. Come along and listen to two politicians having a debate. Um, can I just start off by thanking the Cooper Business Network for arranging this event. Um, we have coming up in, in 10 months time or so, a very important vote. It's probably the most important political question any of us in this room will face in our lifetimes. This is not like a general election where you elect a party of government and then four or five years later, if they don't deliver, you can vote them out again and vote somebody else in. This will be, if we vote yes, an irreversible decision to change our constitution. So I think it's absolutely right that we are uh, as well informed as possible about the consequences uh, of the vote that we'll all be participating in. And I'm delighted that the Cooper Business Network have provided this opportunity for you to hear the arguments and engage and have a debate about the, the issues on both sides. The question of the referendum isn't whether Scotland could be an independent country, it's whether Scotland should be an independent country. And that's what we need to decide, whether leaving the United Kingdom and becoming a separate country would be better or worse for Scotland. And what would it mean not just for us, but for all the generations who follow us? Because it's not just a decision for the current generation, but a decision potentially for hundreds of years to come. I passionately believe the best choice for our future is to remain a strong and proud nation while benefiting from the security and opportunity we can take advantage of as part of a greater United Kingdom. We can bring out the best of Scotland by working together across the UK. We've achieved an awful lot together and working together in the future, we can achieve a lot more. And if you want an example recently of people working together, just look at what happened with the dispute in Grangemouth where a potential disaster for the Scottish economy was averted by Scotland's two governments, one in, in uh, Edinburgh, one in London, working together uh, with their different approaches but in cooperation for the good of Scotland's economy. That's the sort of template uh, that Scotland benefits from. Two governments not working in competition but in cooperation. Staying a strong part of the UK is in our best interests. Our companies will have more customers, our young people have more opportunities and we face less risk in an uncertain world. The pound is our currency. We don't have our interest rates set in a different country, like in the Eurozone. And while we've seen other small nations overwhelmed by the global crisis, we've been protected by the strength in numbers of the United Kingdom. Being part of the UK is good for jobs in Scotland. Scottish companies sell four times as much to the rest of the United Kingdom as they do to the rest of the world combined. Four times as much. And as part of the UK, Scotland, a nation of five million people, 
is part of a home market with more than 10 times that number of customers, 60 million. We have 200,000 Scottish jobs depending on companies which sell pensions and mortgages, where nine out of 10 of their customers are from the rest of the UK. And staying in the UK makes financial sense for Scotland. We've got public spending that is £1,200 a year higher per head than the rest of the UK. And we don't risk the budget for Scottish schools and hospitals on the volatility of oil prices. The difference between the year when the oil was at its highest and when it was at its lowest would represent the entire budget of the NHS in Scotland. Now, the Yes Scotland campaign will say, and we've heard it from John Swinney tonight, that Scotland's in a relatively better fiscal position than the UK as a whole. But what they don't say is that still leaves us with a £7 billion annual current account deficit, nor that on their own estimates, by 2016 that position will be reversed and will be in a relatively worse position. It's been a hard few years after the last global economic crisis. I think everybody in this room who's involved in business will know that. Things are tough for many people. And the last thing people want when they're struggling is more cost and more upheaval. It's not worth the gamble. If we vote to leave the United Kingdom, we will have just over 500 days before we set up a separate state. That's the period between 18th of September 2014 and April 2016, which is the preferred independence date. 500 days. And in the rush for independence, we have simply too many unanswered questions. What currency would we use? Would our mortgage rates be set in a foreign country? How would pen benefits and pensions be paid? How much would our national debt be and how would we pay it off? Without the detail on how independence would work, what it would cost us and where the money would come from, voting to leave the UK would be a huge leap in the dark. The best decision for Scotland is to vote for a better future working together with our other partners uh, in the four nations who make up the United Kingdom and saying no to the risk and uncertainty of separation. We've just been through a very difficult economic period. I'm sure you all recognise that. We are starting to see the signs of the economy growing again. That's very positive. But let's not put that at risk. We're better off staying in the United Kingdom. Thank you. John, is there anything you'd like to uh, immediately pick up on what Murdo said well, let there? Me, let me just uh, pick up. Murdo made the point that um, there is a, a hunger for information, and uh, that's something that we've responded to as a government with the publication over the course of the last uh, nine, ten months of a series of papers covering a whole host of different questions um, on the question of currency, for example, and the macroeconomic framework that we would put in place, um, we published information which was not authored by us as a government, but we invited um, four leading international economists, um, led by Crawford Beveridge, the chair of our Council of Economic Advisors, involving um, uh, Professor James Morlees, um, a Nobel laureate, one of the world's leading experts on taxation, Professor Joe Stieglitz, another Nobel laureate, um, who set out in enormous detail, 200 page detail, the macroeconomic framework that they thought could be established and was workable for an independent Scotland. What that was based on uh, was an examination of the different currency options that exist, um, but coming down as we have accepted as a government in favour of the maintenance of sterling as the currency of an independent Scotland. So when, when Murdo says, you know, we don't know what currency we'd be using, I'm absolutely emphatic about what currency we'd be using. The proposal of the Scottish Government has been and will be that we use the pound sterling as our currency. Um, the Fiscal Commission, um, this group of economists, also looked at the question of um, how the, um, the arrangements for the preservation of an integrated financial services market in the whole of the United Kingdom could be protected by ensuring, as part of an extension of uh, retaining sterling as the currency of an independent Scotland, we would retain the Bank of England as the lender of last resort, and with that, the infrastructure and uh, the environment of uh, conduct regulation that would ensure that we could maintain an independent, a, a, a unified financial services market 
in the United Kingdom, preserving the opportunities for companies to trade cross-border. And the argument about the currency point, which is the compelling argument from my perspective, is that it's, a, it's as much in Scotland's interest as it is in the interest of the rest of the United Kingdom for us to continue to use sterling. Um, there's as much trade comes uh, north over the border as there is goes south over the border. So maintaining that um, similar currency um, is uh, an essential part uh, of the proposition that we put forward. Now, at the end of November, uh, at the end of this month, uh, the Scottish Government will produce the White Paper on Independence, which will be a comprehensive explanation of many of the issues that are raised in this debate, and it will capture information that we've published so far, uh, detail that we've, we've published and put into the public domain, and I think give people the sense and the depth of the analysis that's been undertaken to formulate this proposition. And of course, that will then be the subject to debate in the period from uh, November through to September in 2014. So, um, yes, I'm all for um, the open production uh, of information, and we put a lot of that information into the public domain. But when we do so, um, on questions like the currency, I think it, you know, it, it should be accepted that that is our proposition, not that there's some, um, so, so, so some period of waiting required to find out what our position is. Our position is very clear and very emphatic on, on that and many other questions, and that will be reinforced by the White Paper in, in November. Thank you. Murray, you're Th thank you. I, I, I just, I'll just pick up on, on the currency issue if I can and, 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 and widen it to, to some other things John said. I mean, John's been very clear about his position on, on the currency. Um, of course, yes, Scotland, which is the campaign for independence, doesn't necessarily share that view. Yes, Scotland's chair is Dennis Canavan. Dennis Canavan supports a new Scottish currency, uh, as does the Green Party, as does the Socialist Party who make up Yes, Scotland. And of course, if we're going to have a currency union with the rest of the UK, the rest of the UK would have to agree to that currency union, would have to assess whether they want to be part of it. One person I certainly never speak for is the Shadow Chancellor, Ed Balls. Um, but uh, thank goodness for that, you might say. Uh, <laughs> but uh, one thing Ed Balls is on record as saying is if he were Chancellor, he would not want to be part of uh, Chancellor of the rest of the UK. He would not want to be part of a currency union with Scotland. So I think there is still a, a degree of uncertainty here. But you know, I was very interested in, in, in John's basic proposition is you know, we should be independent so we, should take, so we can take all the decisions here about our economic future. But if we kept the pound sterling as our currency, we wouldn't be doing that. Because the Bank of England, which would be in London, which would be answerable ultimately to the government of a foreign country, the rest of the UK, would then be setting our interest rates, potentially setting our borrowing and spending limits as a government. It would exercise a fair degree of control over our economy. And the lesson of what's happened in the Eurozone over the last five years has been that you cannot have monetary union without a high degree of political union to underpin it. And if you don't believe that, just go and ask somebody from Greece how much freedom of operation the government of Greece has today uh, while they're tied into the, the euro. And the reality is to have a situation where we're seeking political independence but retaining a monetary union, it's very difficult to see how that could be uh, a stable uh, arrangement in the long term. The lesson of the eurozone is monetary union requires much closer political union. So I, I can understand why it's a difficult sell for uh, the Yes campaign to say we want a separate currency in Scotland and all the issues with uh, exchange risk uh, between S Scotland and the rest of the UK. But just saying we want to keep the pound sterling doesn't mean it's necessarily going to happen. And it does dilute this idea that we will take all decisions in Scotland ourselves because our interest rates will be set somewhere else. Thank you. Now is an opportunity for, I'm sure many of you are sitting there with burning questions that you would like to, to ask, so uh, I'm going to throw uh, questions out to the floor. Gentleman down here, please wait till you get the, the microphone, please. Thank you. Thank you. I just wanted to ask, uh, yes, we, we, we may not have total control over the currency, but do we have any control over the currency now in Scotland? Because surely the interest rates in London are set for, the, for London. And Scotland hardly, hardly uh, goes into that equation. So I don't see the difference between London doing it now and London doing it after independence, because that's what happens. What was the change? Well, no, no, well, no, no, no. well, my point in response to that is, you know, Scotland is part of the United Kingdom. So when the Bank of England sets macroeconomic policy. It does that in relation to the UK 
as a whole. It's not that long ago we had a Scottish Chancellor of the Exchequer in Alistair Darling. Before that, it was a, it was a Scottish Chancellor of the Exchequer in Gordon Brown, who was Prime Minister. The current Chief Secretary of the Treasury is a Scot, Danny Alexander, representing a Scottish constituency. So I think you can reasonably argue that Scotland has no influence uh, in, the, in the government of the UK at the moment and in, in economic policy at the moment. Uh, and if your argument is that it doesn't, then you know, what's the advantage of going to independence if things wouldn't change? John. Let me, um, yeah. look, there's a couple of perspectives I've got on, the, on this question. The first thing is that the, 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 if you look at um, all comparable situations to any that Scotland would be compared to any kind of Western European, um, uh, American con uh, comparison, any developed economy situation, governments do not set interest rates. The setting of interest rates is hived off to an independent monetary institute, in the case of the United Kingdom, to the Bank of England, um, in the case of the Eurozone, uh, to the European Central Bank and to affiliated bodies. And um, the same is the case in the United States. So politicians don't actually set interest rates. And if the Chancellor of the Exchequer today was to say, I'm going to reverse the Bank of England legislation of 1997 and I'm going to start setting interest rates, the markets would go absolutely off the deep end because the world has moved on. Politicians are no longer setting interest rates. So if we're not setting interest rates as politicians, I think that undermines the argument that Murdoch is putting forward. But the second point is this argument about um, the Eurozone situation. Um, the problem in the Eurozone uh, is not the fact that um, an institution outside a particular country is setting the interest rates. The problem is the fact that one institution is trying to set interest rates to cover one of the most productive economies in the world, the German economy, and one of the most troubled economies in the world, the Greek economy. And the difference in productivity between the Greek and the German economies is colossal, absolutely colossal. But the Scottish economy and the English economy today, or I should say the rest of the United Kingdom economy, is broadly comparable. Our GDP uh, per head in Scotland is broadly comparable to GDP in the rest of the UK if you don't take into account oil. Add in oil, and our GDP per head is 20% greater than the GDP of the rest of the UK. So the idea that somehow we are in a vastly disparate range of uh, situations a la Greece versus Germany is just not borne out by the reality. So if we're going to have a debate about this particular point, let's have it on the basis of what is the reality of the situation that we're dealing with. And of course, it, it, although politicians may not be controlling um, interest rates, politicians most definitely are controlling fiscal policy. And part of my beef about what I've had to wrestle with over the last five years or, uh, since the economic crash, and particularly over the last three years, when I've wanted to pursue a fundamentally different economic policy to the policy of the United Kingdom government, is that I've not had the ability to exercise the economic levers to do so. And that's what independence would give me, or, or uh, a finance minister, to do in Scotland. And the final point I'm making all this, and um, I'll just say in advance, it is a cheap political point that I'm about to make, so I'll just volunteer the fact that I'm about <laughs> to make. But Murdo Fraser, I think inadvertently, has conceded the 2015 UK general election <laughs> by saying that Ed Balls might have some influence. I said, over said might. Which is, I said might. Which is, which is for me, uh, an inconceivable prospect, but maybe it's something that Murdo thinks about on a regular basis. <laughs> Thank you. Do we have another question? Uh, on the front row here? <laughs> Thank you. Uh, one of the main points of the Yes campaign is that decisions and policies are imposed in Scotland, but often uh, Scotland's MPs vote against it. One of these is the bedroom tax. I'd like to ask both members what impact does this tax have on the business activities of social landlords across Scotland? John, I'll let you go well, first. Um, <laughs> I think it has a, it has a, a, a real and a difficult effect on the business interests of social landlords across the country because um, what the bedroom tax is, is, is doing is it's forcing um, either individuals to um, default on the rent which begins to undermine the financial credibility of social landlords and 
you know, from my perspective, I rely on social landlords um, in the in the public. Well, I'm, I'm going to say in the public sector, so, uh, housing associations. Let me use that terminology. I, I rely on them to have robust uh, flows of resources coming in through dependable rental income, which they can then prove to financial institutions as a dependable source of investment to then borrow against to build more social housing. And I need that to work robustly to ensure that so housing associations can, contribute, can continue to contribute towards the generation of um, good quality social housing in Scotland. And that is undermined when they've got tenants who are defaulting on uh, the rent. And of course, there is now rising evidence of that defaulting happening. Um, the second impact that it has is that it undoubtedly um, affects the capability of individuals to contribute more significantly to the economy as a consequence, because they're having to find money to make up shortfalls in rental uh, activity. And of course, the, 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 the worst thing about the bedroom tax is that its origination, the reason why it was actually thought about and put into place, has nothing to do with the housing market in Scotland. It's about housing benefit levels in London. So a problem in London has then been converted into a uniform response in the whole of the United Kingdom and therefore our arrangements, our good working arrangements in Scotland start to get undermined by a policy which has no foundation in Scotland and no requirement in Scotland. And that's before we get to two other crucial arguments. One is the democratic argument that you've mentioned. Um, most Scottish members of Parliament, an overwhelming majority of Scottish members of Parliament, have opposed the bedroom tax and it's been imposed in Scotland. And the second argument is the, the moral and the ethical argument. I just find it fundamentally distasteful that we are now employing people to go around measuring people's bedrooms to see if it qualifies as a sufficiently large and extra space in which people should live their lives. I find it utterly distasteful. The impact of the bedroom tax on social landlords? Uh, well, if, I mean, the first comment I'd make on that is that the UK government's welfare reform agenda, in its generality, is popular in Scotland. And we have polling evidence that says that. The proposal to make people work for benefits is popular. The proposal to cap benefits is popular. What, what, what I, I find difficult to understand about this concern about the under-occupancy charge that's been brought in for social-rented housing is that a very similar change was made by the Labour government more than a decade ago for private rented housing. I don't remember any of these complaints being raised at that particular time when exactly the same measure was brought in for private rented housing. Uh, nobody in the House of Commons objected at that time. Nobody who was an SNP member in the House of Commons objected at that particular time to that change being in. And I don't really see why it's all right to have that change brought in in the private rented sector, but not to have it brought in in the social rented sector. I'm not sure there is a difference between the two. No, no, well, I, well, no I, I fundamentally disagree with you on that because a lot of people who are renting in the private sector are in exactly the same social situation as those renting in the socially rented centre. They, they will be getting their, their rent paid for by housing benefit, but instead will get uh, accommodation from uh, private landlords. So, you know, I, I understand there's a political point being made here about what some people call the bedroom tax, I would call the under-occupancy charge. People are making a political point about that. They would be on firmer ground had they been uh, consistent in their view in changes in legislation that happened more than a decade ago. Right, let's m move on to a, another question. Uh, wow, lots of people. <laughs> Uh, at the front here, sec second row, sorry, at the, at the front. Uh, gentlemen, there's been two um, fairly independent bodies that's passed comment on the independence debate. One is the Glasgow University Centre for Public Policy, and the other is the Institute for Fiscal Studies, who have made some comments between them that they believe that Scotland's finances would be deeper in the red if we left the UK. Um, that there would be a net fiscal loss under independence and furthermore that the um, First Minister's <coughs> plans to cut corporation tax by three pence in the pound is based on strong assumptions and a large dose of guesswork. Are they incorrect? 
Wow. Um, well, <laughs> um, um, my view is that, well, they're entitled to their, they're entitled to their view, and I think what, certainly what's been, the, the, the characterisation of what they've said is, um, is a, uh, somewhat fruity, if I might, uh, if I might comment th th to that extent. Um, if you look at the, the data, um, you know, the United Kingdom is running a structural deficit today and has run a structural deficit for many, many years. So, you know, the, the idea that somehow countries living in deficits is something new and it would be the first time it ever happened under an independent Scotland is one enormous big fallacy because we're running a huge deficit at the present moment. And the um, comparative financial information that is available, which emerges out of the analysis of the Scottish economy undertaken by um, independent statist statisticians um, published annually in the Government Expenditure and Revenue in Scotland report, which is published to a national, accounts, uh, a national statistical standard, demonstrates that Scotland is in a comparatively stronger financial position than the rest of the United Kingdom. And if that's not just a, that's a, that, that was the position in 2011-12, if you go back over the past five years, um, Scotland was in a comparatively stronger fiscal position to the rest of the UK uh, to the tune of about £12 billion pounds of revenue. Still in deficit, I concede, but then lots and lots of people, including the United Kingdom, are in deficit. So um, the, the data, um, I think, that's produced by the uh, statisticians under the umbrella of Government Expenditure and Revenue in Scotland, which is the annual approved, respected text um, an analysis demonstrates that Scotland is in a comparatively stronger financial position than the rest of the UK. On the question of uh, corporation tax, um, you know, we, we, we've, we've used the powers that we've got already as a devolved administration to reduce the costs of business. So when we came into office, um, with I would have to concede the support of the Conservatives in the budget process, we reduced business rates for small companies and for about 89,000 businesses in Scotland now, they either pay no business rates or a very significantly reduced level of business rates. And that was designed as a signal of the direction of policy that we believed to be important in enabling business to retain more of the revenues that it generated to support investment within companies and to enable companies to take the decisions to expand their activities and to support new developments. Um, that's not a, so that's what we were able to do within our existing powers and a signal of our intention. So the, the, the proposition that we advance of reducing corporation tax is, um, is in the, sim the same vein. It's about trying to enable companies to retain more of the proceeds of their activities and their revenues to enable them to invest for the future. And I don't think it's a, a particularly surprising policy development um, because both Gordon Brown and George Osborne have both reduced corporation tax with exactly the same intention of trying to encourage and to motivate greater business investment in the economy as a consequence of their activities. So, you know, I can't write the reports for the Centre for Public Policy in the Regions and I can't report, write the reports for the Institute for Fiscal Studies, but I do put them into a sense of context about what other commentators and what other actors do uh, in this debate. Well, what I think is interesting about the question is, is, is that, you know, John represents, yes, Scotland and I represent better together. We will come along and we will give you our opinion on what's going to happen if Scotland votes for independence. But this is what we are saying, and you, you quite rightly will sit there and take with a pinch of salt everything we say tonight. What's important in this debate is we get properly independent voices coming forward and giving their opinion, which is why you know, when you get academic research from uh, respected independent institutions coming out, they should be treated very seriously. And I thought both reports that came out this week were very interesting and very instructive. Now, J John's again made the point that you made earlier about the finances of independent Scotland. Now, the, the, the document I have here is, is, is John's own cabinet paper, uh, which was leaked to, to Better Together, which makes it perfectly clear that while the case that John puts out uh, is supported by his own document, by 2016, the year in which we would become an independent country, we would be in a relatively worse fiscal position than the rest of the UK. 
So, and of course, the, the, the fiscal position that Scotland would be in is very heavily dependent on North Sea oil revenues maintaining their, the levels uh, that they are today or indeed, indeed increasing. So, uh, you know, I think we need to, to, to listen to these independent voices. Just a point on the, on the business tax. I mean, John's absolutely right. I'm delighted that, that we were able to work with uh, the SNP to cut business rates for small business. Uh, some of the things the Scottish Government have done since then on business rates I don't agree with. I don't agree with the retail levy. Uh, I don't agree with the uh, changes to empty property relief, which is taking more tax out of business. Uh, the forward budget from the Scottish Government proposes to take an extra, I think, 450 million in rates from Scottish business over the next two years. And John says, well, our ambition is to cut corporation tax. But that, of course, is predicated on the SNP being in government in an independent Scotland. If we vote for independence, there will be elections held in, uh, I think, 2016 to elect a new government. The SNP can say we would cut corporation tax if elected. We don't know if they'll be in government. We don't know who will be in government in an independent Scotland. So we can't assume that the proposition put forward for independence by the SNP is necessarily the one that would come into uh, effect in the event that we vote for that. And this is the key point about independence. It's not, a, it's not like a general election. You're not just voting for the party you like to be in government. You're voting for a constitutional change that almost certainly is irreversible. Okay. Uh, Catherine, gentleman at the front here. Yeah. In Scotland, we have an energy policy that's really predicated on uh, having 100% renewable equivalent electricity by 2020. At the moment, that means that a, a unit, a kilowatt hour of electricity costs £100. £50 of that is the wholesale price, £50 is subsidy. The £50 subsidy at the moment for the percentage, I think 60% of wind turbines, for instance, which happen to be in Scotland, the, 50, the, the subsidy is shared among all the citizens of the United Kingdom. If there were independence, it would seem to me that it would be very likely that all this cost would fall on the citizens of Scotland. And that uh, would be a huge burden to bear. Another point about this, and John uh, Swinney will tell me, uh, tell me shortly, that where do we uh, sell our electricity um, when we have this huge capacity of, of renewables? And he will say that England will buy it, buy the electricity. But that surely won't necessarily be the case in, in a separate country. So th that's my sort of point, the cost of uh, s sustaining our electricity. Well, Murdo, I'll give you the opportunity to respond first. Well, I think, I think, I think, I think, I think Graham is, is, is a very fair question. It's a point I have made myself on a number of occasions in the past. We benefit from an integrated UK energy market at the moment. Uh, the First Minister in, in, in the Parliament yesterday was talking about how that was bad for Scotland, how it should be torn up. Um, and yet, it's the UK energy market of 60 million people that provides the subsidies for Scotland's green energy. But you know, I said a moment ago that you, know, you, you should take with a pinch of salt everything we say. I have some very interesting comments just this week from Professor John Kay, who was the First Minister's uh, Chief uh, Economic Advisor until very recently, who said that the SNP's green energy vision is a fantasy. That's what he actually said in a speech given this week. And he, he went on to say, uh, the subsidy of these activities, which would have to come from the rest of the UK, is something that can't be assumed to continue. So don't believe what I have to say if you don't want. Listen to the First Minister's former Chief Economic Advisor, who says there's a major problem here. First things first, let's, 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 let's be absolutely factually correct here. Professor John Kay has never been the First Minister's Chief Economic Advisor. So Murdo Fraser just said something to you which isn't true. So there's, and I'll, and I'll, I'll defend that com remark I've made to you till I'm blue in the face. Right, was, it, was, was he on the Council of Economic Advisors? He was on the Council Thank of you. Economic Advisors, but he was never the Chief Economic Advisor, which is the better together antics of trying to inflate something into what it is not. So I just warn you to be careful and cautious about how people on Murdo Fraser's side of the, of the argument present the argument. Now, the, the, the point that's made by gentlemen is a very important point because it gets to the heart of continuity of energy supply. 
And it's not a debate that takes place in isolation. It takes place within the context of um, the wider commitments that all states have to make in relation to their international commitments to reduce carbon emissions. And one of the principal sources of carbon emissions is our energy generation mechanisms. Transport is uh, about the other uh, most significant uh, factor into the bargain. Now, whether, whatever happens about the constitutional structure of Scotland and the rest of the United Kingdom, um, all of us that live in these islands will have commitments that we will have to fulfil internationally to reduce our carbon emissions. And the people of England are still going to, whether Scotland becomes independent or not, going to have to decarbonise their electricity consumption. And they can't do that. Well, they can do it in two ways. They can do it by uh, building extensive renewable energy capability in England, which the current UK government looks to me to be very, very uh, unlikely to enable to happen, given the chaos they've inflicted on the energy markets by the electricity market reform process they've undertaken. Or alternatively, they can purchase renewable energy generated in Scotland, where we have uh, a significant and bounteous opportunity to generate renewable energy. Now, I know that renewable energy is uh, a divisive subject. Uh, the gentleman asked the question, and I take a different view about renewable energy. I'm, well, I, I, so I won't, I won't, try, I won't paraphrase. Uh, my view is that I'm very supportive of renewable energy. I think it is our duty as a society, given the enormous environmental pressures we face, that we should use the electricity generation mechanisms and measures and opportunities that we have as a country, and they are principally around renewable energy. So um, I think it is entirely conceivable that the people in the rest of the United Kingdom, if Scotland becomes independent, and they still have to, which they will do, have to fulfil their commitments to uh, reduce their carbon emissions, that they will, um, th they will purchase and obtain that from Scotland. Why? Because the infrastructure enables it to happen. The physical infrastructure enables it to happen. And the other point, which I think is, uh, is an important other aspect of this debate, is about the whole um, uh, debate about interconnection between different jurisdictions. The European Union um, supported a study that was undertaken between Scotland, the North of Ireland and the Republic of Ireland about uh, interconnection of electricity supply to ensure that we could, we could generate renewable energy in one part uh, of the European Union and uh, use uh, the, the whole interconnector uh, arrangements to transfer that uh, and to sell that to other places. And that's a really important study. We welcomed it. It was conclusive that this was a good opportunity and a good way to proceed. And I think it, it, it hosts a big commercial opportunity for Scotland. But it's also crucial for the rest of the UK because the UK government has signed up a deal with the Republic of Ireland. What to do? To purchase renewable energy from the Republic of Ireland. A foreign country, no less. The United Kingdom government has signed a deal to purchase renewable energy, would you believe it, from a foreign country, the Republic of Ireland. So I think that's a pretty sound basis for taking the judgment that the arrangements that we've put in place are strong and robust for the electricity markets in the years to come. I'm just going to give uh, Murder the opportunity to, to come back on one or two points there. Yeah. Um, John's going to say something quite important there, and I, I don't want to be accused of, of saying something that's not true, so I, I wrote it down, and he said it was entirely conceivable that the rest of the UK would continue to buy our energy. It is conceivable. That's not the point. Is it guaranteed? Is it guaranteed? Will it be the case post-independence that they will buy our energy? Because if it's not guaranteed... It could mean a substantial increase in our energy bills. And to suggest that you know, people in the rest of the UK have no alternative but to buy Scottish energy is ridiculous. We've just seen the uh, contract signed for a new nuclear power station at Hinkley Point. Nuclear power is classed as low carbon energy, and therefore it meets all the climate change targets. Uh, it is coming in cheaper than wind power in terms of the strike price. And therefore, they could go down the nuclear route, or they could indeed buy nuclear power through interconnectors from France. There is no guarantee 
they will buy our energy. Therefore, we are by no means clear what the situation would be if we vote for independence in terms of what that means for our energy bills. Uh, John, I'll give you the same uh, courtesy to yeah. is it further well, comments I, I you'd think, like to make. Mm -hmm. I, I, I would just gently uh, counsel Murdo against claiming the enormous economic advantage of nuclear technology into this debate because we are essentially uh, the, the level of subsidy that has been put into the nuclear industry to enable the development at Hinkley Point uh, to take its course is of eye-watering proportions. And every analyst I have seen says that the UK government has been taken to the cleaners in the establishment of the strike price that they have taken on in relation to Hinkley Point. So if that is the defence of the alternative strategy, it is a, it is a very thin defence. It's, it's a strike price situation. lower than the strike price for well, wind. It's, a, it's, a, it's, a it's lower than strike price for wind. It's a catastrophic decision that's been taken. Okay, I'm, I'm going to uh, move on from renewables because I think that's a, 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 a very emotive subject. Uh, uh, gentleman down here, uh, John, just uh, near you. With, yes. Mm -hmm. Yes, um, one quick question um, really as regards Scotland and Europe um, and the power of Scotland and Europe. We're going to be a small country in a big conglomeration. What does it actually mean? And will you have the power not to take on the euro? Will you have the power to say no to the euro? And will you have the power to make a difference in big Europe? Well, on, on, the, on the euro, um, there's a whole set of uh, steps that you have to take if you want to join the euro. And the first of them is that uh, a country has to volunteer to join the exchange rate mechanism. And it has to do that for a period of two years and then go on, uh, it starts a process to join the euro. So it's a voluntary decision that a country takes to start off on that route. And we do not intend to take that voluntary step at the beginning because our view, our, uh, our, our position, the position that we, that, that, that we set out and which is the, the Scottish Government's position, the proposition that will be put to the people of Scotland, is that we should continue to use sterling. Second point on influence in Europe. Um, I look at the various countries of Europe, and you know, the countries of Europe are large and small, uh, they're very diverse, um, but every one of those countries has the opportunity to participate in, some of the, uh, in all of the decision making that takes place at a European level. And what it's invariably about is about building alliances, building cooperation, working with others, finding shared interests, and pursuing your interests through that uh, mechanism. And um, I watch what um, a variety of small countries are able to do in exercising that influence, and I think it's an example of what Scotland should be capable of doing. And when you get to the position where, you know, the, in the absurd situation that um, a country like Luxembourg, which is a landlocked country, has got the ability to speak at the top table of Europe about an issue like fishing, when our country, Scotland, doesn't have that opportunity to do so. It has to be done through a UK delegation, which often takes decisions and approaches that are not in our interests. It strengthens the case and the need for us to have a direct voice in the European Union. There will be 500 days in the period if we vote yes in September next year to when we become independent to resolve a whole range of issues, one of which would be our position within the EU. And we have absolutely no clarity as to what that position would be. It will be a political decision to be taken because the admission of a new member state, which is what would happen if Scotland votes for independence, it would become a new member state, would require the unanimous agreement of all the other members of the EU. Is it likely they would welcome Scotland as a member? Yes, I think it is. Do we know on what terms they would want Scotland to be a member? Can we assume we would inherit from the current UK all the beneficial terms that we currently have, all the opt-outs we have on currency, on the Schengen free travel area, the budget rebate that the UK currently enjoys? We can't assume that. We have no idea what view the other member states might take. What view would the government of Spain take to the entry of, the UK, of Scotland as an independent state, given its own pressures with the Basque Country and Catalonia? Would it take would it be welcoming or would it take a hard line? Would it drive a hard bargain? We simply don't know what the terms would be 
of Scotland's EU membership. Therefore, it is far too early to talk about the influence we might have because we don't know the terms in which we could join if we joined at all. Well, what the, what, what, the, what the UK government has said is, is, is that if, if the Conservative Party wins the, the general election after 2015, there will, be, there will be a renegotiation of terms. It's very interesting to see, you know, every time David Cameron goes to Europe these days, how welcomed he is by Angela Merkel in Germany, because she sees Britain as a key ally in terms of the reforms in Europe uh, that she wants to see happen. So we'll have, we'll have if we are successful, an in-out referendum on the EU at that point, and people will then have their say. As a Democrat, I think giving people their say is a good thing. I think, I think th there's a... Uh, I, I'm very interested in this question because I, 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 you know, I have an emphatic view that Scotland should be a member of the European Union. Um, I, I served in the House of Commons for four years from 1997 to 2001 and I sat and listened to many people who are still in the House of Commons and they would have had us out of the House of, Co uh, they would have had us out of the European Union tomorrow and they're still there and they're determined to get us out of the European Union and that is the mood within a large proportion of the Conservative Party in the House of Commons and it will become <coughs> ever more shrill the more the political threat of UKIP presents itself to the re-election of the Conservative Party. And it's interesting in the debate, I, I obviously have a, 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 a deep and intense association with the needs of the business community in Scotland. It is my job to make sure that's the case on behalf of the Scottish Government. And in amongst all the kind of talk that we have about uncertainty created around the independence referendum, the uncertainty the business community in Scotland is talking to me about is the implications of an in-out referendum in the United Kingdom as argued for by the Conservative Party. And it's pr causing profound difficulties for businesses that are involved in international business activity. Uh, Sharon, gentlemen right at the back there. Mm -hmm. Um, Margot, your initial uh, speech was the usual better together, uh, doom laden stuff. Um, and yet, the reality is, everything that we see before us is positive. People like you said uh, if, if an, in an independence referendum would chase away um, investment, foreign investment's gone sky high since independence was mentioned in 2011, since the referendum was mentioned. It's gone sky high. This is all about faith. In the TV, every other day these days, a Scottish university is doing something which is going to have world implications. Every other day, our research and development in Scotland is fantastic. And I personally, it wouldn't worry me if we were going to lose 10%, 20% initially after independence, because I know this country, the country that produced television, telephone, fridge, ATM, uh, beta blockers, everything, has got the brains to create a wonderful independent country. That was Not so much of a question, I think. I know, more of a statement, but let me, let me, let me, yes, let me, let me give you a, a response. Far, far from being doom laden. I think Scotland has a very positive future, continuing in the partnership of four nations that make up the United Kingdom. And I think the part we play in that partnership of four nations has been an extremely positive one over the centuries. And Scotland has done very well out of that relationship. You look at all the great Scots who have contributed to Britain over the years. The number of Prime Ministers of the United Kingdom who have come from Scotland is far out of proportion to the, uh, the, the population share. And, and the contribution that Scots have played to, to industry and to the professions and commerce as part of the United Kingdom. I'm not doom laden. I'm, I'm entirely content being Scottish and British, and I'm proud of both. Now, clearly, sir, you are a nationalist. I respect the nationalist view. I just don't happen to agree with it. I think we're better off as part of the, of, of the United Kingdom. And, you know, it's not far from being doom laden. You know, I, I think, you know, well, one of the things that makes me smile in this debate is, is, is when we hear, oh, better together, just being negative. Yes. The most, well, thank you. You just confirmed my point, sir. Um, you know, the most negative thing I hear in this debate are people who are nationalists 
continually talking down the United Kingdom and telling us how dreadful the United Kingdom is. I don't think the United Kingdom is, is dreadful at all. I think we've done great things as a partnership of nations, and I look forward to us being able to renew that partnership together. Now, you raised a very specific point, which is interesting about universities. At the moment, with a population share of about 8.5%, Scottish, university Scottish universities win research grants from the UK research councils of around, I think, 15% of the total. So we punch far above our weight in terms of that money coming from UK research councils. The UK research councils are not going to exist on a UK-wide basis in the event that Scotland votes for independence. The people in the rest of the UK are not going to be happy seeing their taxes going out of Scotland, going out of the rest of the UK, rather, into Scotland, into a foreign country, to fund research at Scottish universities. That's what you are putting at risk by fighting the case of independence. I, I think there's a... Um, there's a... There has to be a recognition in the debate that... Um, there are many um, strong uh, things that have been uh, achieved uh, by Scotland uh, in the last 300 years. Um, so, a matter of fact, the gentleman went through a whole host of examples of what's been generated in Scotland. But I think we have to look around our country and think, well, could we not make this more successful? Could we actually not achieve a great deal more? Is it not possible for us to imagine a situation where we might be able to equal other countries of the similar kind of size and character as Scotland in delivering levels of economic growth uh, on a constant basis. If we did that, we'd be able to start to eat into some of the fundamental inequalities that exist in our society, which we talked about a second ago in relation to the bedroom tax. The things that, um, that trouble me, I, I saw a constituent this morning um, uh, wrestling with the issues of the bedroom tax and the horror that that's inflicting on the lives. And, that, and, and to me, that's about well, what type of country are we going to be and how are we going to generate the wealth to make us able to address these issues and these perspectives. And that's, for, for me, what the debate is about. Can't we wrestle with how can we make our country more successful? And my fundamental point, as I said out to you at the outset, is that where we've got power, in Scotland, where we've been able to exercise that, I think, by and large, people believe that we've made a good job of it, that we've actually used those powers wisely. And why should we think, somehow, if we got more powers, the full range of powers, we would do anything other than exercise those powers to make the country a success? And that's what the debate should be about. Um, right at the back there, uh, middle Bill, if you want to wave your hand and get the, the microphone. Mm -hmm. Leading on from the gentleman's point here, we've been hearing a lot in the last months about um, currency, uh, passports, armed forces, and all the questions that, uh, what are we going to do about these things post-independence? But it seems to me that these things have been done before. You look at Slovakia and the Czech Republic. Yeah. So really these, these questions seem to me to be either red herrings or scaremongering. Okay, can, can I ask, really, rather than just statements from the audience, please, I would prefer to, uh, it, uh, to have questions, and, and this is a business debate, I'd much prefer to see questions in, in a business uh, context and, and environment. Uh, the lady uh, in the red... I work in tourism, and I have recently been told that when I put down my tick under the yes box, that the SNP actually plan to register every single tourism uh, operator, industry, anyone in tourism, has to register with the government. And therefore, the implication is that this will incur an extra charge on my business. Can you confirm or deny this rumour? Just tell me it again. <laughs> I was informed by a well-meaning friend that uh, if I voted yes in the referendum, then the link that was sent to me, which I didn't even bother to open by the way, uh, would actually, the government plan to charge or register every single tour guide, tour operator, travel, whatever in the tourism industry, and that we would have to register with the government to be able to continue our business. 
and I was warned to read the bump before I voted. I deleted the email and didn't bother opening the link. <laughs> Uh, but I would really like this confirmed or denied. Have you reached this level of detail? It, well, the, 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 the <laughs> <laughs> well, if we if we if we have this level of detail, hasn't reached me. <laughs> um, I, I I I have absolutely no idea what that's about. To be honest, none whatsoever. The idea, you know, the idea of constructing national databases makes me come out in a cold sweat. The thought of it, so. Um, no, that, uh, that, that there, that there is no substance to that whatsoever. So I'll have a bigger profit margin then. Ah. Thank you. <laughs> I'm just looking at the, the time. I'm going to uh, have one final question. Um, John, just... Uh, oh, we've, we've rather had lots of uh, 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 mails, so I'm going to go to the lady at the back in there. Thank you. What I've heard tonight is a lot about uncertainty. And whenever I talk about the independence referendum and what the result might be, um, what people are worried about is the uncertainty. What is it going to look like? And in civil society, there's a lot of conversations going on at the moment. You know, what might Scotland look like? How can we make this a better place? Let's write a constitution for our country to keep politicians at bay. And uh, my question is, and I actually agree with one of Myrtle's points in his opening statement that independence is a leap, leap in the dark, but so is staying in the union. Mm -hmm. what, no, no, this okay. current government set up, are we happy with this? Yeah. yeah, I'll leave that open to the crowd. But my question is, if the, now I'm going to compare two things, if the UK government wants to negotiate with Europe what its relationship might be and then go to the polls for an EU referendum, then why won't they negotiate with the Scottish government and the Scottish people about what independence might look like? Start that negotiations yeah, yeah. now. So we have the answers to what Scotland will look like after 500 days. Well, can I, can I, can I, can I, I mean, I, I, you know, uh, it's a perfectly fair question. Let, let, me, let me answer it directly. There's nobody currently who represents the people of the rest of the UK. This, you know, Scotland is part of the United Kingdom, right? Scotland's part of the UK. So there are Scots in government, Chief Secretary of the Treasury, one of the, one of the quads in the government, is Danny Alexander, a Scot representing a Scottish constituency. So, you know, the UK government represents the whole UK, including Scotland. What side of the negotiating table is Danny Alexander going to sit on if there are pre-negotiations before a vote? You know, it's just impossible to construct that. You would have to create an institution to represent the people of England, Wales, and Northern Ireland exclusively, and then sit down and try and enter negotiations. No, I think it's much more sensible to do it the way we're doing. Let's ask the people in Scotland if they want to become independent or if they want to retain their faith with the other nations who make up the United Kingdom. And if people in Scotland decide they want to be independent, at that point we then decide if we're going to break up. It's a bit like a business partnership. If you're in a, a, a business partnership and you decide you're going to break your partnership, you know, you sit down with your business partners and say, right, what am I going to get when I walk out the door? That seems to me the right way around to do things. But it's not about what side you're on. It's about the scenario. So you have one path, you won't know if you stay in the union. We don't know what that looks like, but you'll keep going down that same path. If you vote yes, I'm sure people in Westminster and the Scottish Parliament can sort of figure out what things they need to negotiate on and start looking at how you might do that negotiation Start thinking about how you would deal with your civil service and your responsibilities and see which goes where. You can start these talks now. I think this is a, I, I think this is a, a, a really fundamental question this debate, and let me try to explore it as dispassionately as I can. Um, there is always uncertainty in politics. You know, there always is. There's, you know, um, we speculated on the uncertainty that would arise if Ed Balls became the Chancellor of the Exchequer <laughs> in 2015, Murdo. Perish the thought. <laughs> Perish the thought. But, you know, so there's, th th there's always potential for change and difference and choice. And that's democracy. And nobody's guaranteed a living. You know, I spent the entirety of the parliamentary recess that we've just had uh, trying to deal with the fact that um, 1,350 workers in Grangemouth 
thought they had a secure job at the start of the, summer, the, the October recess, and halfway through it, the plant was closing. So, you know, that in the course of seven, eight days, it went from absolute certainty to closure of the plant. So there is a lot of uncertainty that we all wrestle with in life uh, and in, in different circumstances. So, and, and I think the idea that somehow the uncertainty only ever is about the independence proposition, when is the point you make is absolutely fair. We don't know what the UK is going to continue to look like. I've got a fair sense of what the UK is going to start looking like, and I don't much like the look of it with some of the decisions like our bedroom tax and all the rest of it, as to where that's taken us philosophically as a country. Um, now, when it comes into the, the arguments about pre-negotiation, which you've raised, um, we have to remember that we are currently in a political debate. So when the UK Treasury produce a paper, which various people say, oh, the Treasury's produced this paper about the economy or whatever it happens to be, it gets taken as a sort of authoritative, impartial, dispassionate opinion. It's not. It's a product of the United Kingdom government, who are a player in this debate, a political player in this, in this debate, as much as I am a political player in this debate. So there is a need for us to try to make progress on the areas where we could perhaps give people greater clarity. If we got to, let's take the point of currency. George Osborne came to Scotland and set out the currency options. Every broadcaster in the country sat him down and said to him, come on, just tell them they're not going to get it. Just say it. You know you want to say it. Just say there's no way we're going to have this currency union. Ed, Ed Ball said it. I know. Well, but, well <laughs> I, rest my, I rest my case. Indeed. <laughs> well, but the Chancellor of Exchequer, the man who currently holds the office, not the one that kind of fiddles around, um, um, the one that holds office would not say that. Why? Because I think, in all reality, if Scotland votes yes, it makes sense for the rest of the UK to agree to a currency. Um, now, if you, what I cite also as my as my kind of assistance here is the talk around about the arrangements for the referendum. The Prime Minister went on television in January 2012 and threw down the gauntlet to us that we were going to, you know, fiddle the referendum, we were going to be, you know, bending the rules, uh, he would have nothing to do with it and all the rest of it. By October of 2012, he was sitting in the First Minister's office in St Andrew's House signing the Edinburgh Agreement, an agreement between the Scottish and United Kingdom governments about all of the details about the referendum. So you no longer hear anything of debate about the rules and arrangements about the referendum, because it's all been arrived at by mutual agreement. We're completely happy. As far as I know, the UK government's completely happy. That's the type of, I think the process would be helped if we had a bit more of that, and a bit less of, you know, it's all going to be so much more difficult than we all, in our instincts, in our common sense, know it's actually going to be. OK. Thank you. I, I apologise. There's plenty more questions out there, uh, and uh, I'm sure there's going to be opportunities uh, throughout the, the rest of 2013 into 2014 to learn a lot more. What I am going to do now is ask Murdo to just deliver a, a closing statement. Ladies and gentlemen, it's been a very good debate. I've enjoyed hearing your questions, and I've enjoyed the level of discussion. It's also been, I think, a very, a very good natured debate, and and we've had a. A, a, a decent level of conversation. I hope we'll have many more of these over the 10 months we face this very important question. I'm somebody who's very comfortable being part of the UK. I'm very comfortable being British. I believe in the partnership of nations, the four nations that make up Great Britain. I think we've done great things in the world over the past 300 years. I understand there are people who don't think like I do. There are people who are nationalists, who take a different view, think Scotland should be independent. I don't agree with them, but I respect their different view. But I haven't heard any compelling case from a business perspective why Scotland would be better off as an independent country. One thing we haven't talked about much tonight is what would happen to trade if Scotland became independent. There is something known as the border effect, where 
if you create two independent countries out of what was a country before, the level of trade between the two drops off over time. We saw that when Czechoslovakia uh, broke up. Uh, probably the best, most recent example where the level of trade falls off. What about separate regulation for things like financial services in different parts of the UK? We touched a bit on things like currency. We touched on the issue of the, the customer base for most Scottish businesses. The, the export market, the largest export market by far, is the rest of the UK. And what would it mean for these customers if Scotland were a, an independent country? Scotland benefits from the safety and security of the bigger UK economy. We didn't get around tonight to talking about RBS in the news today or the, the banking crisis of, uh, of five or six years ago when it was the resources of the UK Treasury that came and bailed out Scotland's two biggest companies, RBS and HBOS. Uh, and we're able to do that because the strength of the UK economy and the UK Treasury stood behind them, which might not have been the case had we been an independent country. So I think when it comes to the business case, there are a whole range of issues still unresolved. We don't know what the economics of an independent Scotland would be, what the finances of an independent Scotland would be. We're asked to make, as somebody said in the audience, you know, a leap, a leap of faith. But to me, in some ways, these, these issues are, are less important than the more fundamental point, which is I believe in our partnership of nations. I believe we should be working with our neighbours. I don't want to see people in England, Wales and Northern Ireland, many of whom are my friends and my relatives, as citizens of a foreign country. There are hundreds of thousands of people from England, Wales and Northern Ireland who live and work in Scotland and there are hundreds of thousands of Scots living in England, Wales and Northern Ireland earning a living there. I don't want them to see them to be citizens of a foreign country. We've done a lot together in the past, working together as a partnership. We can do a lot more in the future working together as a partnership. That's why I think we're better together. Thank you. Um, ladies and gentlemen, can I start off by saying that I think um, I think Cooper has uh, has not for the first time uh, demonstrated uh, how it should be done. This has been a courteous, well-informed, dispassionate, reasoned debate and discussion. And if you want, you know, I speak to loads of folk who say to me, "We need to have more of that uh, in 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 the, the referendum." And I. I took, I took part in a television discussion from Inverness a few weeks ago with um, uh, Murdo's colleague Annabel Goldie, uh, Willie Rennie from the Liberals and Patrick Harvey from the Green Party and um, it was a pleasure to do it because everybody behaved, nobody interrupted each other, we were all courteous to each other and the audience participated, sometimes they were fruity, sometimes they were quite <laughs> voluminous but everybody on the panel behaved in a reasoned and respectful fashion. Uh, sometimes I can't watch these debates because I find them so absolutely off-putting. And, I'm, and I'm, my, my life, my adult life has been consumed by the argument for Scottish independence and I can't watch the debates because they're so acrimonious. So I think Cooper has done, has, set, has, has blazed a trail tonight. So thank you for the man and, it's, and, and thank you to Murdo for um, the way in which he, as always, uh, conducts these debates um, on the substance of the issues involved. Uh, and uh, that's, all, that's me absolving myself from my cheap political point about Ed Balls that I need. <laughs> um, I, I think we, we, we have a great opportunity as a country to just take the next step. And we, we took a big step in 1997 when we voted in a referendum by a very decisive majority to establish a powerful parliament within, uh, within Scotland that would enable us to take decisions about issues that matter to the lives of people in our country, about health and education and transport and local government, the things that really affect people's day-to-day -day existence. And what I'm asking people in Scotland to do is to take a decision which will enable us to take further steps to transform the lives of people in Scotland. If I'm frustrated by anything about where we are in Scotland today, is I'm frustrated by the fact that I know this is a strong, rich, prosperous country, but we could do so much more. Because we don't have to travel very far from here to encounter parts of our country where people are really struggling. And we have to ensure that the prospects of all of our citizens are more greatly enhanced by the way we generate wealth and use wealth to the advantage of our citizens. And that, to me, is the great prize of independence, because we can bring together 
Uh, a lot of the things that we, we, we can't join up in Scotland today, I can't join up the tax and benefits system because uh, with the wider economic powers and responsibilities that we have because they're undertaken by different governments, often to different agendas. And I want to make sure that we use everything, every resource we have at our disposal as a country to create the best opportunities for Scotland. And that, to me, is the opportunity and the prize of independence. And the other thing which is important about the debate is it's a debate about what we want to say about ourselves and about our contribution to the world. Because I think this country has a long and distinguished history of making a significant contribution to the world, whether it's been about the inventions and the developments that we've shared with the world, whether it's about the products that we sell to the world, whether it's about the thinking and the culture and the ethos that we've communicated from our small country to every corner of the world. And I simply want us to live up to that very uh, rich and distinguished history by making that contribution to the world on our own terms. And that's, for me, the basis of the opportunity and the prospect of independence. I look forward enormously to the debate uh, in the run-up to September 2014. There are precious few countries in the world have the opportunity to shape the country that we all live in. And this is our opportunity. And I hope Scotland decides to choose an independent future. Thank you very much. I've thoroughly enjoyed myself this evening, actually, sitting here. I didn't really want to do this job this evening. It was. Uh, <laughs> But I've enjoyed sitting here and listening and having... Sorry, the microphone. I do apologise. I've enjoyed sitting here listening and having the time to sit back and think about such an important decision. And I hope you've all uh, gained something from coming along this evening. The objective tonight was to learn more, to be better informed... I think there's still a lot of questions, there's a lot of answers out there, there's more information that we probably do need to be able to make a decision. But I'd like you just to, for a moment, just uh, join me to thank Murdo, to thank John for coming along to Cooper on a Friday evening and giving us a very balanced and, uh, 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 as John said, a, a very civilised uh, chance to debate what is going to be such an important decision for Scotland. So would you join me?